inflation, how bad could it get? What might people want to do? Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics and glad to be joined by everyone watching at home today, as well as my dear friend and one of my great mentors and certainly teachers in the silver world, who is, of course, David Morgan, the silver guru of the morganreport.com, a man who is, as I think about my adventures in the past you know, decade and a half in the silver world, uh, not always the easiest path. And David, you've been doing this for quite a while and a great job of it. So it's a pleasure to have you on in here today because I did get some questions recently. People watch the channel and certainly hear about silver and gold all the time, but wonder in terms of, I wouldn't say if we get an inflationary environment, I think we've already gotten that, but you know, if that evolves deeper, if we get to hyperinflation, just some thoughts about navigating life and some of the conditions that come along with that. So David, it's great to have you here today and dig into these things. And most importantly, how are you, my friend? Well, I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm feeling good. It's good to see you. And uh, it's great to be on your show. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to have you here. And I suppose real quick before we get to inflation, how bad could it get? What might people want to do? We'll take a quick look at the pricing on Monday morning. 26.56 in the December futures on gold. And we are up to 31.18 or down slightly uh, as of this morning, but back above $31, which I think is certainly an encouraging sign. And David, any quick thoughts on what we've seen or what you might expect to see as we head towards the election and the end of the year? Oh, well, going to the metals, I mean, we got the silver futures up, so keep it up there. I think what's interesting uh, is when we hit that spike high uh back in the uh, last day of april 2011 uh we came back down but we actually stayed above the 30 level for quite some time on this chart it looks like it's pretty weak but you know i mean we're going from 1975 present day so we actually had about a year and a half where we were above 30 mm -hmm. uh after with the spike it held above well above 30 somewhere around 31 as you got the line there uh, and then it dipped down. You can see if, you know, you squint a little bit for about six months. It came back up and then it hit, uh, I believe it was 2950. I forget the number. I put out an alert to all my paid people and said, this is the third test on the way down. If we break down below this cell or hedge or whatever. And when it happened and I called it just in time, people took advantage of it or not. I don't know. I mean, some said, thank you. Some said nothing. Uh, you could see that huge, you know, cup that we went that took years, you know, from that point where you got all the way down and we got excited in 2016. I got excited in 2016. <laughs> we got that big run. Thought it back and fill, but no, back down to another low. And then, of course, we got that big move in the uh, 2000 with the illness and then back down to that 125 to one. And now we're back up. So I said all that to say this. Once we get above that 31, 2, 3, I say about 33, you can see there's no overhead resistance. There's hardly anyone ever bought any metal that high. So most people will be at an all-time high, and so they won't want to sell. They'll be holding. So any new buying will put a lot of buying pressure on there. It's like a stock. It's you can Think of it like a stock. A stock has got a very tight float, and it's making a new high. Does it take a lot of volume to move the price higher because no one's selling? So the floats is tight. No one's selling. So it'll be the same thing in the silver market. I'd love to see it, you know, above 33. I'd like to see it at 40 by the end of the year. Will we get there? I don't know. Could we get there? I would say, yeah, we could. Especially with gold, you know, continuing to make these nominal new highs. Yeah, it certainly will be interesting and whether we see that this year or at some point in the future, obviously, as we'll dig into, we had not only a rate cut, pretty darn aggressive rate cut. One last note on the chart here. We see the times that it's gotten above that 30 level has not been off in one, two, had three briefly in 2021, but now here we are, which that alone is not saying that we're headed to 50, but last couple of times it broke above that. So at least some optimism in the pricing. Although what is less optimistic, David, is obviously the conditions we're facing 
like I mentioned, you've been doing this for the seventies, I believe was your start studying silver. You were, is that correct? Yeah, I was you working, uh, you know, in the air cup as, but I was always looking at the uh, markets, futures, and you know, the, all the markets. Sorry, trading stocks when I was 16 and, uh, just fascinated, especially the honest money and the sound money. You know, there's really in the early days when I was young, I mean, we talked about the honest money or sound money campaigns and, you know, there was a lot more alliance to silver bean money in those days because, you know, I'd been in circulation, not, you know, that long ago, for example, right. you know, 71, uh, you know, in 64, uh, we're circulating silver and then 65, there were a lot of people still circulating silver. It disappeared pretty quick, but they didn't even know any better. You know, they would believe what the government said that the Johnson slugs were just as valuable as the silver money. And of course it's not. So it did disappear. Anyway, back to you. <laughs> well, I mean, that was a lot of the foundation that was laid and that things that people were talking about in terms of debt, inflation, that, you know, I guess for a while, it felt like we were talking about it. Now we're experiencing it. And here again, everyone's favorite, JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon, yet obviously a mainstream establishment voice. And this was uh, about two weeks ago now, and here was the article. And he was worried at a raft of inflationary forces, such as higher deficits and increased infrastructure spending. Hard to see many scenarios in which that does not continue to be the case. So we've had the inflation. The things he cites sure seems like we have a lot more of those going forward. Also saw a chart uh, from the National Bureau of Economic Research that says if we had been using the 1983 CPI methodology, that in 2022, their calculation said inflation would have been calculated at 18%. Even using the CPI numbers, we can see from March of 2020, prices are up, according to CPI, over 20%. So long uh, intro to the question there. First of all, uh, I guess, do you expect this to get to a point of hyperinflation or when people are thinking about how to plan and figure out how to nav navigate the next couple of decades of life? Uh, maybe we could start there of what you expect and does this get to uh, some of the things we've seen historically? A great question. I mean, I'm taking a deep breath because first of all, no one wants a hyperinflation. I mean, a hyperinflationary depression is the worst of all worlds because the currency isn't trusted anymore. I mean, a true hyperinflation is the Weimar Republic, what happened in Argentina and Venezuela. I mean, there's pictures on the internet. If You've probably seen them, but maybe some of our viewers haven't, but you can Google it pretty quick. And, you know, there are literally currencies in the gutters that people won't bother to pick up because it's that worthless. Now, will that happen in the U.S. dollar? I really doubt it. <clears throat> but the trend is, as you point out, stagflation where you have higher and higher costs uh, and <clears throat> you have less of a, you have uncertainty. You have a lot of things that are similar to a debt liquidating depression. High unemployment, high uncertainty, costs go up, uh, unaffordability of, you know, basics, you know, food going up, you know, whatever, 30, 40 percent. You know, as Mike Maloney says, it's not the CPI, it's a CP lie. I mean, they take out food and energy, the two things humans need the most. I mean, what kind of a what kind of a scam is the government running here, you know? So <clears throat> I do think the trend of uh, higher inflation is pretty much built into uh, now, even though they use all kinds of metrics, this hedonic indexing and all this crap they come up with. But uh, and they are lowering interest rates. And that's very good for the bond vigilantes, the people that trade in the bond market. Uh, does it really help real estate? slightly but not a whole lot at this point unless it goes far lower which it could and probably they'll force it but i'm a bit of a contrarian's contrarian i think that uh they are not going to get away with this lowering of interest rates for a very long time i don't think they could do it for the next two years uh they might do it for the next few quarters i'm not sure but i do believe with the shortages that are built in the market with the problem with the foodstuffs for um the war efforts throughout different parts of the world and the problems with uh, the illness a few years ago and government saying, you know, taking on their farmers and what you can grow and can't grow and why you can and how you have to, what energy source you can use. 
and all this nonsense that's going on with the uh, you know technocratic bureaucrats at the top of the pyramid with their AI derived ideas of how to make the planet more green when it's everything green is almost the opposite. I could go on that tangent. I'll stay off of it. So I do think that you're going to see more and more inflationary pressures and that they might have to be forced to turn around and raise interest rates some more. The problem is you cannot raise interest rates high enough to do any real good in the real economy unless the inflation rate is, excuse me, the interest rate is above the true inflation. So if the true inflation rate's 18, let's just make it 10 for talking purposes. And the government says it's down to four. But if it's really 10, you really are not going to take that uh, inflation away until you put real interest rates above the 10. And that happened under Volcker uh, way back in you know 1980. It couldn't happen again because the interest payment on the national debt would be beyond belief and really couldn't even service the interest, which we're getting close to over time anyway. I mean, we are adding, you know, a trillion dollars to the deficit every hundred days. So, you know, it's 360 days a year or so. In less than a year, every year we're adding another three trillion dollars to the debt. And then it's something that very few people talk about, but I will occasionally, and that is you know, what Professor Sizemore and Captain Austin Fitz reported on that there's really $20 trillion that was in the black budgets that's never been put on the national debt. So really, we're more like a $55 trillion rather than $35 trillion. And that's the current deficit. That's what you owe on your credit card that you got to make a monthly payment. It's the off-budget items with that are unfunded liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, and military pensions that gets into over a hundred trillion. So, I mean, you're really in a situation where we could go into hyperinflation. Will we get there? I don't know, but it's really a psychological event as much as a math problem. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, it doesn't have to be the majority of the people. It only has to be a few percent, but those few percent move enough money rapidly enough. It's called velocity to money where they're spending it faster as fast as they can because they're worried about its value being worth less a month from now, a week, a week, a month from now, two months from now, six months from now. So you don't care if T-bill rates go up to 10% if you think that the cost of food is going to be 25% in that same time frame. You'd rather buy the food and store it than you would to get interest of 10%. And we're not there yet. Will we ever get there? You ask me, I don't know. But the trend is that direction. That's what I'll tell you. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I guess that's the part that concerns me the most sometimes, because uh, especially in the election cycle, I've heard different views of, hey, we could raise more revenue doing this. Yet, if ultimately the thing is run by someone and no matter how much revenue you have, they're going to spend more. And if they haven't figured out, they'll find a new way to spend money and uh, similar dynamic with the Fed, where here, even with the economy, we're told it's strong. Even 25 basis points wasn't enough. So certainly what happens when we do have an overt recession. And um, David, uh, by the way, I like that. The <laughs> illness of 2020, we'll, we'll leave that aside. And although since you did mention Volcker, I had to pull this one up. I've, I've been rereading this for the past week. This was in my fantastic Joe Bannister book, discusses why the uh, IRS mentions the word voluntary repeatedly in their tax code, which probably is just a mistake, most likely. But uh, we had a Paul Volcker quote where he mentions, if the overriding objective is price stability, we did better with the 19th century gold standard and passive central banks with currency boards or even with free banking. I thought that's interesting where here's almost the king of the central bankers and even he's acknowledging that, you know, we're we're in a system that isn't doing so well and I know I said we're not going to stay too focused on gold today, but one other thing I'd like to pull up before we get back to that is something I was thinking about today, where here you have gold uh, down near 250 bucks, 2000 and 2001. So we've seen gold more than 10x in the past 23 years. And as you have already been describing, we have the conditions that we faced back in 2000 are 
exacerbated beyond that. You mentioned the missing money. I've heard Dr. Skidmore and Catherine Austin Fitz, they had an updated number even past the yeah, right. 21 trillion. Um, I think it was in the <clears> hundreds. <throat> Seems like they have been actually Emore emailed Dr. Skidmore uh, a while back. Seems as, this is my own impression that he's not been encouraged to talk more about yeah. it by the government. Um, of course, that would include the missing 2.3 trillion from September 10th, 2001. Yet, nonetheless, obviously, gold. I think, especially after where we are this year, you can see what's happened in the last 20 years under similar conditions that now are exacerbated. So nice we're at a point where at least I think it's a little easier to see gold filling its role. But what outside of gold, you talked a little bit about food, which especially hearing Kamala Harris talk about price controls at the supermarket. I think for anyone who studied what happened in the 70s and you've talked about during the Great Depression as well, that's a bit disconcerting. But we'll step away from the gold and silver part a little bit now. Anything in terms of food or other areas? And I know you talk quite a bit about some of these. So what could you share there? Well, we talked, you know, pre-interview. I mean, the Smoot Hartley Act was done during the Great Depression. It was to protect American farmers, so they put uh, price controls on or tariffs, excuse me, and they, all it did is make the world depression worse. So price controls don't work. Tariffs really don't work. A free market is what works, and yet this is a well-known fact, but it's part of the historical record. But the as Santiana said, the greatest lesson of history is that people do not learn the lessons of history. So they'll keep making the same mistakes. I fully expect, you know, Trump's for tariffs, uh, Harris is for, you know, price controls. Neither one are good for anyone. But uh, the masses don't know that because they're not taught. And they don't think and they don't read and they don't study and they don't understand. Uh, and, and I get it. I mean, I'm not trying to put anyone down. It's just... You know, most people are out there working two jobs now. I mean, I don't it's most people, but many people. And they're just too busy making a living. And they're too tired to, you know, look at what you and I discuss. You know, it's people that have saved a little bit and are concerned about what their savings is going to evaporate to in the future. They're taking measures to try and educate themselves. And many have become quite educated and realized that, you know, an ounce of gold didn't change from 2000 to 2024. That ounce is the same. How come it's 10 times you know, more fiat now than it was 25 years ago? Well, because it destroyed the currency uh, or destroying the currency. So I think we want to talk a little bit to kind of circle back, uh, not lead this, but I think we want to talk a little bit more about the hyperinflation. I mean, I think you had some questions for me on you know, what happens to mortgages. What most people don't know that don't live outside the U.S. or U.S.-centric is in many places in the world, there are no more. You know, most of Europe, you have to buy the um, property outright. That's why so many middle class or upper middle class rent in Europe, because you have to, there is no mortgage in most cases. I mean, there might be exceptions with the private party, but there's no mortgage brokers or anything close to that uh, in many places of the world. South America is pretty much that way. In Mexico, you got to pay full up. Argentina, the same. So people ask, you know, well, what happens to your mortgage in Argentina? Nothing. It doesn't exist <laughs> on a credit card, <clears throat> excuse me, on a short-term loan, like a signature loan or credit card debt. When they revalue, they just revalue the new currency. So you, you basically pay. Your debt doesn't go away. It just gets re-indexed. So, um, so I think that's something that you had for me earlier on. Yeah, and anything... Uh... I think you mentioned how they, they don't have the same mortgage system down in South America. We did have a question someone asked particularly about Argentina and Venezuela, how some of those things look before and after and anything that you could share on that. Yeah, it's well, what happens is, you know, good money chases out bad. When, I think a lot, most of our viewers would know, but many, you know, never look at this subject matter. I mean, the black market, free market, in a lot of these countries, use physical pieces of paper that are printed by the Federal Reserve. They're called Federal Reserve notes, and they're green with pictures of president. And that's the true economy. So there, are, there's the bank rate that you could take your pesos in and get dollars, and then there's the street rate, 
where you can change your pesos and get dollars. So a lot of it goes to U.S. dollars instead of their currency. And when it gets really bad, they'll trade in metals. And most of the metals, and I learned this, not the hard way, just not knowing because I hadn't gone through it, but having been to Argentina and these other places and talking to people in the know, a lot of it's jewelry. They'll take a ring and weigh it, you know, see if it's sterling uh, or a ring, bracelet, necklace, earrings, anything that's silver or gold, they will take in exchange for, you know, another product or a service or whatever. So you have the U.S. dollar greenbacks trading with alongside physical metal. And it's not always, you know, shiny, round, government stamped, one ounce, pure silver. You know, there's, in fact, there's a lot less of that. Now, in this country, uh, if we went into that kind of a situation, you'd see a lot more, you know, coinage uh, because there's a you know, fair amount of stackers and that kind of thing. But in these foreign countries, a lot of it just is jewelry. Uh, and David, in terms of food, again, touched on this a little bit, but I know there's a lot of prepping channels out there and people have their varying degrees of to what extent they go. But I know you and I have talked about this before, certainly the idea of not being entirely dependent on the local supermarket chain, but perhaps becoming aware of local farmers, building relationships, uh, similar to what you were saying with uh, gold and silver perhaps down in South America, maybe going and meeting someone in a local coin shop so that if you do have to sell at some point, you're not ending up in a situation where you don't know the person and you end up getting a bad deal. But some of these things I think are also things that at least people can consider and you don't have to jump all in and have 10 years of food supplied right away. But any thoughts on those types of steps? Yeah, I think it's really good to um, make acquaintance, no matter where you are with, you know, any farmer's markets, if they're in your area, or if you can drive to them reasonably, you know, half hour drive, hour drive even, uh, and then make a, uh, you know, some relationships. Uh, we have them here, and I always offer them silver. And most, I'd say 80% say yes, some don't want it, but uh, a lot will, you know, in fact, they know me by on site. <laughs> When I come in there, oh, that's the guy that pays us in silver. Hey, hey, you see more, you know what? So I think it's a very good idea. And I like what you said, you know, and uh, just for the education part, <clears throat> if you are in a situation where you need to hawk some jewelry or whatever, you might be better off just going through a third party, you know, go into a coin dealer. They can, uh, let's say you're going to accept some silver jewelry or gold jewelry. Uh, you don't know if it's 14 karat, 18 karat, if it's uh, really just uh, plated. So you could tell the other party, hey, I'll do the deal, but I want to make sure this is real. Let's go into a, uh, you know, this coin shop and find out. In fact, if you let me digress for a minute, Please. I had a friend of mine on a real estate deal and we wanted to, he wanted to buy me out. And I said, okay, you know, I, I, I agree to the deal. And I won't say the amount of money. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was a fairly good chunk of a change. And he wanted to pay me in gold, but it was you know mine gold, gold dust. And so I talked to my dealer here and I said, he said, is it from Idaho? I said, I think so, but I don't know for sure. He goes, oh, that'd be about 75%. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. And my friend was telling me it's, it's like 99%, you know, and I kept my mouth shut and sometimes I speak up, but it's always good to kind of, if you don't really know, just keep your mouth shut, you know? And we went in there to do the deal. He brought in, you know, these baggies of, of gold and he laid them out and put them in a pan and they shot it with the gun. It was 99%. It was damn near 100% pure. So he poured out enough to pay off the debt. And then I made a deal with the dealer to take that because, you know, they deal with the wholesalers and the refiners all the time. I mean, I've, you know, gone in to see people in the line before me and they would take rounds and throw them in the, in the scrap bucket sometimes jewelry mostly silverware that kind of thing but sometimes just the coin is beat up to throw it in the scrap pile so i asked him if i could exchange the dust for you know uh pamp bars i think i did because it was the lowest premium and he did and he only charged me like i don't want to lie because these guys know me for years so he used to give me 
you know, kind of the family deal. But I think I only paid like 2% to convert it into what would be usable for me because I'm not going to take a back of gold dust around to pay off another debt, right? But anyway, I digress. But I think it's important for people to know that, that, you know, in the real world of gold, uh, there are those kinds of transactions that don't happen every day, but they do. Everyone thinks, well, do I have to have a Krugerrand or do I have to have a U.S. Eagle, you know? Well, you can have gold dust. You can have gold nuggets. You can have gold chain. You can have gold ring. I mean, gold is gold when you break it down. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly, I uh, think it's good to get out. You don't have to go contact every dealer in the nation, but certainly going, I mean, there's local coin stores in, I think, most parts of the country and yeah. even stopping by and getting to know someone so that if at some point you do need to sell gold or silver, you're not starting from the beginning. David, next one on here. He asked, when do we go into real estate and when do we rotate out? Yeah, I think, you know, Mike Maloney's answered that as well as anybody. Do you do, you know, the Dow Jones in terms of gold? We do the Dow in terms of gold. It peaked in the year 2000, even though it's making new highs. How does that work? Well, because you've got a constant, you've got a standard, you've got a gold standard to measure it by. So when you measure real estate in terms of gold, when it becomes cheap, in those terms, that's when you switch out and, you know, maybe not all your gold, but you move from the metals into real estate or into stocks or into a business or, you know, whatever it is. So you have to price it in terms of, you know, what's the historic standard for an ounce of gold for a barrel of oil? What's the historic standard for an uh, ounce of gold in a men's suit? What's the historic standard for it? And if it's, a below average, you know, it's it's undervalued or fair valued or overvalued. When gold becomes overvalued, uh, that's when you would want to swap it for something else. But it's still undervalued. In fact, on the you know printing press amount of paper versus an ounce of gold, that factor of ten x that we have talked about is really just keeping gold constant because the the x factor. Or I'll call it's about eightfold. So the money supply on the base money has gone up about eightfold. Well, gold's gone up 10. So it's slightly ahead of the base money supply, not talking M2 or M3. So we're in uh, a typical inflationary blow off, but we're not in the blow off phase yet. And if we get there, it goes back to the beginning of our conversation where people quit trusting the currency, start trusting, you know, foodstuffs cars i mean anything i mean when i went through it in the 70s i was still pretty young but i mean people would circulate these flyers we didn't have the internet we didn't have cell phones you know old school but you'd see in certain parts of the city where the people pass out these eight and a half by 11 flyers to buy ammunition guns cars gold silver you know anything but stocks bonds or any paper asset you want a hard asset of some type and it's not just gold and silver, you know, ammunition, cars, again, guns, um, you know, stuff like that. And a lot of people caught on at the end, you know, I mean, we had that kind of psychological move where people started to fear what would happen to the dollar going into January of 1980. I mean, silver was on the move, gold was on the move. And it was very, you could call it temporary. I mean, it made that last big rocket ship up on a parabolic move. And then Volcker came in and squelched the whole thing. We had a 20-year bear market. And um, and that's just the way it is. Even though the you know inflation, they kept adding to the money supply. So price of gold wasn't commensurate with the um, amount of paper being printed for the 20 years following the 1980 high. Uh, the psychology had been broken. It was when the psychology was, this, this is going to fail. And then the final icing on the cake was a war in Afghanistan. I mean, that was kind of like, oh, my God, the world's falling apart. And so that kind of gave the last oomph to the gold market. Yeah, and I, I think you touch on something important there, especially with the environment we're in, where I would imagine, especially if someone has a manufacturing business where you can get parts now that at least with what we see on the horizon where Trump's talking about 100% tariffs on countries that are de-dollarizing, 
the same time, Putin recently had a comment about possibly restricting exports of a handful of various uh, minerals and resources. So that's one thing that when appropriate, certainly people could keep in mind of things that I need going forward, let alone the price impact, but the availability, uh, especially in today's environment. And uh, oh, also with the housing, I feel it's worth mentioning. Obviously, if someone's looking to buy a house now, there's a whole handful of factors that go into that. Yet the degree to which if someone has a mortgage at a good interest rate, what would you suggest? Uh, obviously, there is the degree to which if the dollars are being devalued and you're paying them off later can be beneficial. Um, balancing that, of course, with uh, the degree to which someone wants to be in debt. But anything you could say about the concept of paying a mortgage back in cheaper dollars? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you have to look at it kind of a case by case basis. But I think you've got a, you know, two and a half, three percent mortgage. Uh, I would hold on to that. The only problem is that, you know, at the end of these great inflations, governments can do some really interesting things like tariffs and price controls. Uh, maybe you got a rental property and you're making good rent now, but then they put a rent control on, you can't up the rent, but you get, you get taxed higher. So all of a sudden you got a really positive cash flow. And then a year later you don't because you couldn't raise the rent and your taxes tripled. I know it sounds extreme and, you know, do they triple? Well, they do in some countries. I'm not saying that they would in the United States. I'm just saying to be aware of those things. But no, generally speaking, if you got a low interest rate under the true inflation rate, you're pretty smart to hold it. The other thing on a real estate, I didn't ask, but you know, I get this question fairly often. And somebody that's got pretty good savings, that they never bought a house or they're moving, the, and they, you know, know, they want my opinion on, you know, should they buy a house or not? They got all this silver or something. And and I always tell them, you know, buying your individual property, if you can afford it, do it. Because it's a priceless item. Yeah, it costs X amount. It's, you know, 500000 800000 whatever the price is. Put the price out of your mind if you can afford it. You know, you can afford it because you've saved the, not maybe not buy it outright, but it's, you know, it's within your budget. You're safe to buy it. Because it's priceless from the standpoint of that's your castle, that's your home, that's your nest, that's your sanctuary. I use that word because, and what's that worth? And that's worth peace of mind. I can't put a price on that. Now, if you're talking about investment real estate, then I think you want to think about it differently. But if you're thinking about your own place to live, there was a gal over on the other side of the state. And she found a house and she really wanted to buy it, but Wanted me to tell her, you know, what the future held for her. the metals and interest rates and everything else. And I just told her, just put it all to the side. If you really love the house, buy it. Make yourself happy. I and mean, we don't, you know, hoarding money, I mean, real money, someone gold isn't going to make you happy. You know, it's it's really a hedge. It's being balanced in your, your head, your heart about money to understand it. You know, that's why I did kind of the, the documentary, you know, on the Silver Sunrise, because we're so controlled by the money powers, because most people can uh, control others with money. But we have to have our own self-control about money, you know, and that's kind of what I get into in this film, because, you know, it's it's uh, distorted for a lot of people. At least that's what my experience has been, you know, where they can never get enough. Well, if you're a billionaire and you can't get enough, you're kind of sick, you know. And there's people that have enough, and it isn't very much, and let's say relative standards, but they're happy. So, anyway, I digress a lot, but I think it's important because, um, because I've run into it fairly often, and I, you know, people value my opinion or they don't. But when they ask, I tell them how I feel about it. And she was so grateful, you know. So I gave her. I think she didn't need my permission. She could do whatever she wanted. It was her money, but she just felt so much better. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. Like she had this bit of an epiphany. Why am I saving all this silver if I can't use it for something that I want? It's going to make me happy. It's going to make my life better. It's going to give me more fulfillment and all that stuff. So I had to throw that out there, Chris. You didn't ask, but it just was kind of laying on. No, well, it's a 
important thing that uh, I think probably doesn't get talked about enough, especially all of the conditioning around money. And certainly when you hear about things like MK Ultra and the different ways that various forces have spent a lot of time, energy and, and resources on trying to shape the way people think. Uh, I'm glad that you're doing that project. And we will come back to that at the end here and tell people a little more about it. Although two, two last ones before we wrap up. Um, the first would be any thoughts you have on occupation, career choice. Certainly it's something I remember before when I was making the decision to leave the trading floor, which was 2012. There was part of me that wondered, is there still going to be a New York Stock Exchange and people flipping options around back and forth? And along with that, I mention often that I'm a big fan of Luke Groman and listening to his podcast and newsletter. And he talks a lot about how the reasons he thinks that we're not only being forced into some sort of adjustment in the currency system sooner than later, but that while that's going to happen, you know, maybe you have 10 or 15% inflation, but if the U.S. is decides to or is forced to bring a lot of manufacturing back home, that if you're a welder or a carpenter or an electrician, you might actually be beating inflation just because of the demand for your services. So obviously everyone's in a different situation, whether it's a job or a business they have, but if you had any thoughts or, or good starting points if someone's wondering, okay, if we do get this type of environment or if they're expecting more inflation, anything that you might suggest for them to keep in mind and think about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, to piggyback on what you said, uh, the trades are underappreciated. Uh, so welding, carpentry, you know, any of those plumbing, uh, a lot of those high, you know, blue blue collar is how they're usually referred to skill sets are extremely good because they're always in demand during the, you know, good times and bad times. And there's very few uh, people in the younger age groups that want to explore that type of a career. But uh, even if you don't like getting your hands dirty, um, you can learn how to weld for a few years. And if you have an entrepreneurial spirit, you can build a welding company where you just manage it. Uh, so there's a lot there on that side. On the other side, it's kind of like the Great Depression, you know, fill a need and and find a need and fill it. Uh, I think the, you know, um, you know, building websites, writing code, uh, a lot of these stuff that's, you know, AI is taking over some of it. Uh, those type of high tech jobs. I wouldn't really steer younger people to that. I'd look outside the box and look at, you know, what, what the needs are and what people are unwilling to do. I just visited, uh, you know, my friend uh, that's working with me, Ted was here for about 10 days and a little more than a week. And we uh, went and saw a Sapphire mine in Montana. And I was talking to the mine manager, like I always do. And, you know, just how many geology students there are. And there's just so few, you know, so that would be one, you know, there's, I mean, there's actually a need for more and more and more and more and more minerals with this push for everything going electric. And, uh, geez, that means you need more and more and more and more geologists. So mining engineers. Uh, so I would, I would look at that. I would definitely look at, you know, what the major majors are in universities and see what they are. I'd steer away from those. I'd see what the lowest ones are. And I'd, I'd, I'd gear toward those. And always the entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, if you've got an idea running a business on the web or out of a brick and mortar building or or a truck that caters to certain individuals or whatever, and of course, following your passion, if you do that, the money always follows. At least that's been my experience. Um, so that would be my recommendation. I mean, you know, when you're young, you know, at least when I was young, you know, you Life isn't as short as some people will tell you. Yeah, it's short, but there's years and years and years. So to do Long something that you, there love, that you love makes it like you feels like you're you're never working. That's an exaggeration. There's days when I'm pounding out the keys and I feel like I'm, but I'm so passionate still about what I do that most of the time I don't really think about how many hours do I have to put in today or when do I punch out because I work for myself. So. Uh, that's a good place to be, but it's not for everybody. 
There's a lot of people that are a lot more content by punching that clock and punching out on Friday and not thinking a darn thing about their work or anybody at work for, you know, Friday night, Saturday, all day, Sunday, all day, and don't think about work till they go back on Monday. And that suits them. So I guess it comes down to find own self be true. But I would look, uh, you know, I repeat, where no one else is looking, you know, like the great Gretzky, you know, ski where, skate where the puck is and go to where the, the job, the man looks the weakest or is unknown or mm -hmm. uh, not very well recognized. Yeah, I, I like the way you phrase that, especially if you write out what you like to do, what you're good at or have skills in, and then match some of those with where you see need and things going forward. And yeah, and also the thing you mentioned about the mining executives, I've had several uh, miners on the show recently that have mentioned that in addition to energy costs going up for the mining companies, one of the big problems is finding labor that is qualified to do specific roles. So well said there. And David, the last one I'll mention, I had someone write in who was wondering if it's a good idea to buy gold and silver on a credit card if it drops and then assume the price will go up and cover the interest. I was suggesting that that is in the bucket of things that if everything goes perfectly, can it work out? Yes, but... I would was not advising him to do this by any means. And any thoughts you have on that one? Yeah, I know I've always been consistent too. I'm too conservative. I would say don't do it. I mean, you could do it and it does work out. Uh, funny, another real quick digression. There was a guy I used to do a radio show with early on when I first popped on the internet and we did it, oh, I don't know, three, four times a year kind of thing. He would buy a bag of silver at the beginning of the year. Well, remember we had a 11 year bull market in gold and silver was similar. So from 2000, 2011, every year, year over year, gold was at a higher price. Silver pretty much followed that. Anyway, the point was you buy a bag of silver and uh, cash it out in April and pay his taxes. And so he's buying it, you know, X and it was worth, you know, 1.5 X by the time he paid his taxes. And the next year he buy it at, you know, the previous 1.5X, which is the new X, and it'd be at 2X. <laughs> so I'm not suggesting that. I'm just going back to what the guy asked. But we're in a bull market. You can try and get away with it, but the interest rates are so high on a credit card. I just don't look at going into debt on a highly volatile, volatile market. Um, but, yeah, it can be done. I would not recommend it. No. Yes, yes. I think there are perhaps better ways to do that and, with that said, David, I sure appreciate everything that you shared here today. And I know there's a lot of people that certainly look to you for advice. And perhaps uh, as we wrap up, uh, first, you could tell them about the Morgan Report and what you're doing there. Yeah, we're, um, you know, plugging away. We're still doing the newsletter, of course. And, uh, you know, lots of insights you wouldn't get anywhere else uh, on the top tier cash rich companies. Uh, two out of the six are making all-time highs right now, and that's in a, an environment where the mining stocks aren't doing that well. So that does prove that if you pick the right stocks, you can outperform the metals themselves. In both those cases, if you bought the metal at the top of the market in the year 2000 uh, and 11, those stocks are up higher than their highs at that time. And uh, so if we go to the gold, my favorite gold stock, that stock is equivalent to buying, uh, having gold at 6,000 an ounce and it's at 2,600. So that's how much better the stock has outperformed gold price from that time till now. So buying at the previous all time high in September, 2011, you would have bought that stock instead of gold, that value would be equivalent to $6,000 gold. On the silver side, not quite that good, but better than, um, than buying silver at 50. Uh, you, if you bought that, my favorite stock, the one that's making new highs, <clears throat> you would be like um, equivalent to like a $65 silver or something like that. So it does play in a portfolio if you know what you're doing. Remember, in the top tier, I recommend 70% of your money. So it's not like I picked a penny stock that's doing that well. It's substantial money. And the rest of the 30% goes into junior producers mid-tier producers 
And then rank speculations is the money you can afford to lose. So I do it different than a lot. I weight the portfolio. If you weight it correctly, you can do better than the metals. But not many are going to tell you that because most of our friends are bullion dealers. And they'll tell you, buy gold and buy silver and forget the miners because you do better buying the metal. On aggregate, that's true. If you just average it. But if you want to be above average, you want to go to the top of the class, you want to get be the entrepreneur, uh, and you want to make more money, uh, then find somebody that can help you do that. Yeah, certainly with our $2,600 gold price, um, haven't seen a big reaction in the mining sector yet, but I think it's nice to daydream sometimes if we go in the direction things seem to be heading that certainly there is a bull market in the mining stocks ahead. And David, I appreciate that you help navigate people through some of those choices. Uh, easier said than done, although fortunately you're out there and the link to the Morgan report in the description field below. And then just the last one, if you could tell folks a little bit, talk before about Silver Sunrise, the film you have here, but uh, anything else you could add to that? Oh, just watch the trailers. I mean, you know, the subtitle, Breaking Free from the Stress, Fear, and Control of Money. And that's what it's about. I've got uh, Foster Gamble that did uh, two tr uh, Thrive movies. He's in it. Uh, G. Edward Griffin, Ron Paul, Ellen Brown, who wrote Web of Debt, Mark Passio, who does Natural Law. I just finished mine. Uh, Daryl Anka is probably not going to be there. We just finished Edwin Vieira. Uh, Pastor Baldwin is ill right now. We've got some stuff from uh, Larkin Rose in there. And we've got two more on the table that I won't mention uh, that uh, they're going to be on board or they're not. We're just about done with the filming. So then the hard process of getting, you know, an hour or hour or two hours of film and breaking that down to these little segments and making it all fit together like a giant puzzle uh, under the narration, which is already done. Um, is going to be a task that uh, the editor does. But, uh, you know, then there's more uh, trailers than just those. I think if you scroll back up to the top, um, there's that trailers right there. If you click that, there's a ton of them. Uh, and you can go, you can pick out maybe some people that you like to listen to. You know, Foster Gavin, I'm in there now. I just finished. As I said, uh, my... He picked out a segment for me that uh, is fairly good. I mean, it's all about not just the honest money, sound money, and all that you know I stand for, but try to give people the perspective we talked about earlier. That you know you want a balanced life, you want a good life, you want to be um, your best self, so to speak. And money plays a part in it, and it isn't should not be the driving force because, in my view it's got too much control over us. So it's more about taking control of what you can control and being happy with what you have. Now, when you don't have enough, believe me, I get that. But um, we have the ability to, uh, we have more control than we think. You don't want to turn everything over to the big brother. You know, we're in the era, era of where, you know, if you want to work out, you get a trainer. If you want to learn how to cook, you get a chef. If you want to, you know, like everything is, you know, taught to us or done for us kind of thing, rather than being ruggedly individualistic and being able to do almost anything. You know, the Renaissance man attitude where I can learn anything, I can do anything I need to on my own. Kind of that attitude about money. Um, and, you know, what do you really need versus this condition that we all have about wanting stuff that, you know, later on, three months later, why did we buy this? You know, I don't really need to buy this. And David, when when is the film expected to be available? Well, if I get the next two um, guys and gals in the box or in the can, as the expression goes, maybe by Christmas. I'm shooting for Christmas, but that's on my producer, not on me. He's the one that's got to clip and splice and dice and put it all together. And that's at least a four-month process. So we've got October, November, December, and some of September. So we're getting pretty close to that deadline. I don't know if we can do it or not, but that's what we're shooting. Well, we'll look forward to staying posted and whichever month it comes out, I, I think for the reasons we've been talking about for the last almost hour, 
Um, certainly a very important topic, and the link to that will be in the description field below. And David, uh, thank you again, and hope this was helpful for people. And if you'd like to see more about the Silver Sunrise, well, we have a video of one of the trailers that's coming your way. You can just click on that now.